Right, good morning, everyone. Um, if I could ask you to get your coffees and then we'll make a start. It has just gone 10 o'clock. No, it's 9.59 by this, so we are slightly ahead of the game. Um, but if I could ask you to take your chairs, please, and, and get liquid comfort. OK, members, it's gone 10 o'clock now. Um, we'll take you to the uh, welcome to today's meeting, the confirmation hearing um, of the newly appointed chief executive of the Office of the Police Crime Commission. No? Um, welcome, Mr. Heinsohn. Um We have an agenda here which starts off with urgent items. The only urgent item I'm aware of is we have, don't have a space for apologies. So I do have apologies from Councillor Malise Graham of Melton, but substituted by Alan Pearson. I say this slightly guarded because we have the new leader of Charnwood with us. And of course, membership of this committee is the leader or their nominee. So you are the nominee. Okay, so we have apologies from David Slater, is that fair to say? And uh, Jonathan Morgan um, is the substitute. I'm not aware of any other changes. I also think it's important, sorry, Ratalau, no. Oh, Councillor Osman is not here, apologies, yep, okay. Um, I think it's right and appropriate to be helpful to Mr. Heinsohn. We shoot, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have to be reminded every now and then. Um, if we just shoot round the table uh, for a quick introduction to, help, to be helpful. So I'll start to my left with Alan. Yeah, hi. Um, Paul, how are you? And welcome. Yeah, I'm sure you'll enjoy the next hour. Um, Alan Pearson, uh, County Councillor. Uh, I'm Deputy Chair of Environment, also District Councillor. I'm Chair of uh, 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 Community and Social Affairs, and I played rugby, just to let you know. Okay. Ruth Camomile, Borough Councillor for Hinkley and Bosworth. Uh, John Boyce, Odebin Wigston. Uh, Lee Brecken, County Councillor and Blaby District Councillor as well. Jonathan Morgan, Charnwood. Kirk Master, Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner. Willie Bark, Police and Crime Commissioner. Councillor State Coral, Leicester City Council. Councillor Manjulas with Blessed City Council and uh, elected member for Belgrave Ward. Councillor Garvin for City of Leicester and representing for Evington Ward. Michael Rickman, portfolio holder and CSP chair, Harbour District Council. Helen Carter, independent member, have been for five years. This is my last independent member, um, my day as an independent member. Colonel Robert Martin, independent, also last day.
and Joe Orson, SG County Councillor. Um, moving on to item two on the agenda, declarations of interest in respect of items on the agenda. Do we have any? Doesn't look like we have. Thank you very much, members. Moving on to the meat of the meeting, really, I suppose. Item three, confirmation hearing for the post of Chief Executive Officer. I've got a few words to read out here. Um, so um, I do ask you to um, listen carefully. So welcome to today's meeting of the Police and Crime Panel, which is in the form of a confirmation hearing for the role of Chief Executive at the OPCC. The meeting is being webcast live to the public. For those not able to watch the footage live, the webcast will be available for viewing on the County Council's website after the meeting. Please can I remind members to switch off their microphone on when speaking and to turn it off when they have finished speaking. Can I also please ask members to at least put their phone on silent or switch it off. I will now outline the process and the powers of the panel to all. When notified of a proposed appointment under Schedule 1 of the Police Reform and Social Responsibility Act 2011, it is the duty of the Police and Crime Panel to hold a public confirmation hearing and to review, make reports and recommendations in respect of the candidate. Questioning during the hearing must relate to the professional competence or personal independence of the candidate. When questioning is complete, the panel has three principal options as follows. One, if the panel is content with the proposed senior appointment, we can agree to report its endorsement to the Police and Crime Commissioner. Number two, where a candidate meets the standards, but the panel has concerns about their suitability, such concerns can form part of the panel's report and recommendations to the Police and Crime Commissioner. And number three, in the event that the panel determines that a candidate does not meet the requirements for the post, the panel may provide advice and recommendations accordingly to the PCC in its report. Following today, myself as chairman will write uh, to the Police and Crime Commissioner tomorrow, being the next working day, following this hearing, to outline the decisions and recommendations of the panel. The candidate will also be sent a copy of the letter. Should the recommendation be that the proposed candidate be endorsed, that the applicant can take up the post. Following a refusal by the panel, the PCC has the following options. The PCC continues with the appointment. Under these circumstances, the PCC should publicise a response focusing on why he felt that the candidate did in fact meet the minimum standards for the post. The candidate can also decide to withdraw. And the Police and Crime Commissioner can decide not to appoint and instead set out a timetable for a new appointment. I understand that any letters that we send to the PCC will go on the OPCC website and it will also go on this authority's um, website to possibly the cities and the districts as well. Um, so we move on to the stage two of the introductions from the PCC and the candidate. So I'm now going to invite Lord Bar, Police and Crime Commissioner, to explain why he chose the candidate for the post and the process applied. Lord Bark, I invite you to say a few words along those lines. At this point, I would also ask you to consider, I can't request you do leave the room, but I ask you to at least consider leaving the room before Mr Heinsen speaks. I also request that your Deputy Police Crime Commissioner goes with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to members of the panel. Um, of course, we will leave the room at your request uh, after I've finished my opening and hopefully short remarks. Before I 
say what I want to say. Can I first of all say how nice it is, good it is to see Colonel Martin uh, back looking so well. And uh, our congratulations to Councillor Jonathan Morgan. Perhaps commiserations a little bit of, as well as congratulations on being uh, elected as uh, leader of <laughs> Charmwood District Council. Delighted he's still on the panel. I think I'm delighted he's still on, uh, on the panel. <laughs> Moving to the business in hand, I'm, I'm very pleased and proud to be able to present uh, uh, Mr. Paul Heinsohn as my preferred choice, my appointment as Chief Executive of the Office of the Police and Crime uh, Commission. Um, a process was held, which I think is, 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 is there in, in, in the papers. Um, I took the view, uh, having, uh, along with uh, others on the shortlisting panel, and also, interestingly, on the community panel, who I'll come to in a moment, uh, that this was an outstanding candidate for this particular job. Uh, let me just explain um, that uh, a police and crime commissioner must appoint a person uh, to be head of the commissioner's staff uh, and to be called, to be referred to as the chief executive. So there's a statutory requirement for this job. Uh, and then, of course, there's a statutory requirement that once an appointment has been made by me, it has to come to you, the panel, uh, for uh, approval or otherwise. The recruitment process took this form. The post became vacant in October, in February 2017. Um, we made some minor amendments to the person specification, but they were minor, setting out the skills, knowledge, and experience required. And that's to be found at Appendix A of the report in front of you. So the process itself, Mr. Chairman, consisted of three elements to provide an in-depth assessment of each candidate. There was an online psychometric test. There was a community panel, and members will be able to see who made up that panel, and I hope you take the view that it's a pretty broad panel made up from uh, local government, uh, from the largest trade union at the uh, office of the police and, uh, at the at the police force, um, uh, and a senior police officer as as uh, as well. Uh, the composite views of the panel on each candidate were fed back uh, to the formal interview panel that consisted of myself, my deputy Kirkmaster, uh, deputy police. Uh, uh, the Deputy Chief Constable, Roger Bannister, the Head of the Chief Office of Human Resources, and an independent member who is a member of the Commissioner's Ethics, Integrity and Complaints Committee. Process began, seems a very long time ago now, on the 31st of March, interviews on the 27th of July. Uh, as a consequence of that process, no appointment was made. So we started again. Uh, and the second uh, recruitment process began and uh, was similar, if not almost precisely the same, as the first round process. Uh, on the first round process, you will see that there were, I think, 17 applications, five applicants selected for interview. On the second process, nine applications received, five shortlisted. Candidates were assessed against the criteria. Uh, in addition to the psychometric tests and the community panel, uh, interview questions were designed to seek evidence of a number of um, attributes which are set out at paragraph 12 of your report. The proposed candidate, Mr. Paul Heinsohn, was selected as a result of successfully completing all aspects of the recruitment process. The next passage in the report talks about Mr. Heinsohn, and members will have read it themselves and will ask questions if they want to uh, in, a few minutes, in, in a few minutes' time. Can I just say that in my view, uh, Mr. Heinsohn is extraordinarily well qualified for this position. He has a history of senior jobs, 
uh, to start with many of them in the probation service, then the probation trust uh, in this area, in the Leicester, Leicestershire area. And then with great distinction, he served in that, in that role. Then he served uh, as an advisor in central government to the Home Office and then to the Ministry of Justice. Uh, and then, of course, he has done jobs in the probation field with a new probation set up uh, in the course of the last few years. Looking at his CV, which I think all members have a copy of, uh, you will see that I think uh, I am extremely lucky to be able to appoint someone with such an outstanding history of public service, uh, but also someone who knows how the private, uh, private, private world, private industry works as well. So I put him forward to the committee uh, with my full confidence. I think he'll make an outstanding chief executive, uh, um, but I, am of course, want to hear what view the, uh, your committee takes, what the panel takes, uh, regarding his, his, his appointment. Uh, I don't think there's anything else I want to say, um, Chairman, at this stage, and uh, unless there's anything you want to ask, you or the panel want to ask me, um, and uh, I am happy to leave it at that uh, and leave the room for the discussion to continue. Uh, thank you, Lord Mark. I certainly have no questions of you. Do any members of the panel? Nope. Um, so that's fine. Well, thank you very much for that, um, Lord Mark. Um, I invite yourself to leave the room with Kirk, um, the deputy. Can I ask the young lady? Oh, she's not there. Do we continue broadcasting whilst, whilst we uh, <coughs> deliberate? No, once we stop the web... No. <laughs> the story in the Tudor time. No, it was a little Dutch boy, wasn't it, uh, who put his finger in the dike to stop the leak. And I can all remember the old pages have him sitting at the table like that with all his elders around him. And there he was holding his finger up. And you always think of that when I see someone in a similar situation. Um, anyway, welcome, Mr. Heinsen. Just for your information at this early point, all members have been circulated with your CV. Some, the ones who turned up to the proprietary meeting saw it yesterday. Um, but a number couldn't, didn't have the time to come yesterday. They've all had the opportunity this morning. They all have a copy with them. I have made it very, very clear to all members that they hand them in to you and after the meeting. So that's fine. But now, Mr. Heisen, it's your opportunity um, to explain. Nice phrase, isn't it? Why you chose to undertake this new role. And, uh, and basically why you're qualified why you think you are qualified to undertake the role of Chief Executive. I might as well leave it on then, I suppose. <clears throat> um, so why, why did I choose this role and why do I think I'm suitable for it? Uh, why did I choose it? Um, the I have I, I, certain criteria that I uh, use when I'm deciding what I do in different terms, in roles, in jobs uh, that I pursue. Um, the first of those is pretty globally, uh, is, it a, is it a role that's about improving, increasing social value? Is it a role that's public facing that is about improving social value? Um, <clears throat> and it clearly is. And that's been the pattern of my career all the way through. I've always pursued jobs that are, are people facing jobs that are about uh, increasing value to the public. So that, that's the starting point for me. Um, a second element is do I think I've got the, the, the skill set to deliver it? And I think I do. I mean, Willie, Lord Bark was just very 
very kind in uh, uh, describing my background, but um, I have done a lot of things. I've done a, a big range of different roles. Uh, I've, I've done work in change, managing change programs. I've done work in designing and implementing operating models. I've done work in leadership roles, quite exposed leadership roles at times. I've covered quite a wide, wide range of things. So I think I've got the, the skill set that matches the, the job description. The third area is uh, do, do I have the experience? Do I have the background experience to be able to fulfil the role? Again, as Lord Bark was saying, I've got quite a wide range of experience. I've, I've worked in criminal justice pretty much all my work in life. I've done a bit of work in chartered accountancy and I've done a bit of work in academia. Um, but most of my work in life has been in, um, in criminal justice. But I've done it in different settings. So I've worked in public sector locally. Uh, I've worked in central government. I've worked in a large uh, PLC. Uh, I've worked in a small uh, uh, commercial organisation. So I've got the commercial background. I've got the public sector background. I've got the central government background that I think has puts me in good stead for this role and gives me an understanding of where different organisations come from. I've also worked for myself, uh, which is an interesting experience, uh, running my own company and, and, and pursuing contracts with different organisations. So I think I've got a, a, a range of experience uh, that, that meets the, the requirements for the job. Um, the, the final area that I'd, I'd refer to is that I always look for a job that's going to extend me, going to challenge me, going to give me something new that's going to take me out of my comfort zone. So I don't, I don't want to just do things that I feel comfortable with. I want to do things that uh, will extend me and give me a challenge. And I think this job will, will do that as well. Although I've worked with the police for many, many years and I'm very familiar with the police working environment, I've never worked so closely in a police-type setting, understanding the police pressures and, and demands. So that will be my extending myself, pushing myself beyond the, the sort of uh, comfort zone of, of the work that I've done in the, in the past. So I'll stop there. <laughs> I've probably said too much, but happy to take any supplementary questions. No, you, you, you've answered the questions fine, actually, and as I asked, and you've answered it. But I'll just ask one very, very small supplementary. Um, what do you think you will actually bring to the role? I.e., what is an opportunity to refresh the OPCC? So what, what will you actually bring to it? I think the, the, the bit that I didn't talk about is I, I talked about skills and experience and so on, but I bring, I believe, a, a range of qualities that um, I, I'm quite proud of and, and confident about. So I, I bring creativity. I've done a lot of different roles where I've had to do things afresh, do things new, look with a, 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 a fresh eye on different things. So working in the Ministry of Justice, I had to, to redesign the way in which they delivered offender management across prisons and probation. That was a national role. That was a really challenging role because although probation work was... They were, they were very enthusiastic about what I was preparing. Prisons weren't. That was a challenge. And working with organisations that are a bit resistant, a bit awkward, a bit difficult, is, is familiar territory to me. Dealing with organisations that have to change culturally is familiar territory to me. And I've been through that process, probably more so in the commercial sector uh, when I've been running organisations uh, probation-based organisations, where people are unfamiliar with the new environment, uncomfortable with it, having to, to take them along, persuade them, encourage them that this is, this is the way we need to go, is something else that I bring. Um, I think in all that, um, leadership is, is absolutely crucial. And leadership is about the things I've described, having a vision, having a set of values and, and, and you know, pursuing goals. Um, I think there's also a doggedness about it, being able to keep going, being able to persevere, uh, being resilient, uh, pushing hard and keeping things going and injecting purpose when, when it's unclear. I think I bring that as well. And I think the other thing that I want to refer to is in a lot of these roles... Um, it's been far from clear what the direction is. 
um, it's been it's been difficult to build a vision of what the future holds. And and what I've had to do in those environments is live with what I call live with ambiguity. Uh, being able to to pursue a goal and develop a vision whilst the, 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 the way ahead is not entirely clear and be able to take people with you and develop that vision in a collaborative way. I think I bring that as well. Uh, thank you very much. Can I call you Paul? Yeah, of course. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Allow me, Joe. <laughs> um, so thanks for that. There were two bits of good news. Um, number one is, um, that's my final question. All right. Um, <laughs> And the even better news for you is when we met yesterday afternoon, I'm advised that we, we did start off with 22 questions and we were again advised to bring it down to around eight. So okay. it could be worse. So it's one of eight. <laughs> could be worse. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I will now invite the members to question yourself, Paul. And I first turn to the gentleman on my left, Councillor Alan Pearson. Hello, Paul. How are Hi. you? I'm more comfortable now, no one's. Good, that, well, yeah, good. help yourself to a coffee as well if you want, not just water. Um, um, the question I've got is uh, quite simple. What attracted to you, uh, to you to this role? And can you provide an example which demonstrates your ability to strategically plan? Okay. You've already I, touched on it because you've I think talked I've about it. The, if you can expand. Thank yeah, you. okay. Well, what, what attracted me, you know, is, is the element of... It's, it's a role, I mean, what matters to me in, in work is um, the achieving value. You know, I believe organisations to exist to provide, or public sector organisations exist to provide public value. And, uh, and that certainly attracted me. Um, some of the roles I've done in the commercial sector haven't had that engagement with the community that I think this job has, and that, that particularly attracted me. It seems to me that if, if you're delivering public services and managing public services, you've got to talk to the public, engage with the public, understand what the public wants, and deliver the services that they feel are of value. So that appealed to me, and from what I've seen, obviously it's, it's early days for me, from what I've seen, that is a key part of the role, understanding what the public wants and, and, and being able to, to provide it. So that, I think, expands on the first bit. Can you just remind me of the second part of the question? Well, strategically, um, could you give some examples of, of where you demonstrate how you've actually strategically planned or made a plan in, in your career? Okay. Um, I, the, probably the one I've referred to already is probably <coughs> the largest. So um, I, I was responsible for the national development and, and implementation of offender management, <coughs> which um, this is going back a, a few years now. Um, but this was a national development that was about bringing together the delivery of services with offenders across prisons and probation. So it was a very highly visible role. It was reporting directly to ministers. It, it required a strategy, um, and, and that was a written strategy. It was a very, very visible strategy. It was something written down that was available to all practitioners. Around about 30,000 people uh, were involved in delivering it. My job was to articulate it, communicate it, ensure that people were enthused about it and understood it, and then implement it. Uh, and that was over the course of two, two and a half, three years, uh, that I had to pursue that. I went round probably every prison in the country. I went to every probation area. I had national conferences, international conferences. Uh, one of the key parts of that was being visible, promoting it, dealing with the issues. But there was also a, a much more practical element, which was more of a program management methodology. So knowing what the milestones were, being able to... to identify the plan that sat around those milestones, ensure that we're implementing it, deal with problems as they arose, um, you know, sort of risks that arose, the issues that arose, ensuring that we manage those. I think that the other thing that I learned from that is that <coughs> the idea that um, you can design this, this you know, vision of the future, uh, build a plan and go off and do it, um, is 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 not really always possible because the world doesn't sit still whilst you go about your planning and your implementation. Things change. And, and that was the case, you know, with me. I was running a programme that lasted three years. 
you know, the world moves on a little bit during those three years. So the thing I suppose I learned more than anything else is, yes, you've got to pursue your plan. Yes, you've got to be fairly rigorous in how you ensure it's being applied. But at the same time, you've still got to keep scanning what's going on in the world around you, identifying new government initiatives, seeing how they align with the work that you're doing, seeing what other organisations are, uh, are doing and making sure that the work you're doing aligns with theirs. So whilst you've got to pursue a plan and pursue the vision, you've also got to be mindful of what's, you know, what's happening and adaptable to be able to uh, take that into account. Um, I've got a supplementary. Yeah, um, yes. um, I'm quite passionate about management style and structures how they're implemented and of course you have control and command you have system what's your knowledge and how what sort of systems do you prefer in management style management, <coughs> management style is um i'm i tend to work with um a, a much more collaborative approach than, 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 than many i'm not a, a kind of stand up on the table and bang the you know bang my drum i'm much more collaborative in the way that i work trying to get alongside people ensure that i mean being clear about what people's roles are ensuring that people have clear uh, you know, appraisal systems and expectations that are made of them but also for me um what you want to do is for people to grow and develop and have the initiative to, to do that. So I'm really quite keen on encouraging people to you know, develop their skills and improve their skills. I will, you know, obviously, you need to have a performance management structure around the way people work, but I would encourage people to, to try and develop new opportunities, new skills. And within that, there, there is always the possibility that people make mistakes. And we all make mistakes in in our working lives, and my view is that as long as the longer people work uh, to address their mistakes, they learn from them, they're able to develop further, then that's great. The problem I have is when people won't learn. You know, it's it that that's the key thing for me: being willing to try things, being willing to take responsibility, but being willing to learn and improve and develop. Those are the key elements for me. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, I now. Turn to Councillor Coral. Coral. <laughs> One day I'll get it right, Chair. <laughs> Good morning, young sir. Morning. My question is thinking about leadership skills. What achievements in other organisations are you most proud of? And can you also give an example of managing change within a strict legislative framework and explain how you went in about ensuring that the legislation was actually complied with? Um, I've given... I've given the example of offender management. The, the one that was most challenging um, <coughs> was the most recent one. <coughs> so I, I worked for uh, two private companies, uh, a large PLC, uh, where I had to uh, develop and manage a, a change program, and then a smaller company uh, called Working Links, uh, where I had to, to manage... Uh, as I've partly already described, um, cultural change within a very, very tight um, statutory framework, um, it, arguably too tight. Um, it, statutory framework and contractual framework. I mean, the, the, the contract was huge. The contract was an enormous uh, piece of work and, and, and very rigorously managed. Um, um, but as well as that, there's a, a legislative framework that sits around it. So the, the context is really quite tough. Um, uh, the uh, the way in which I approached it was really a, a project management discipline, uh, which involved you know, articulating the, the, the model that we're trying to implement, um, a, a communicating that, articulating that with staff, some of whom uh, weren't all that keen, if if, uh, if I can be honest, um, you know, because this was this was the introduction of a private sector uh, uh, approach within a traditionally public sector organisation. Um, so you, you can imagine there are cultural tensions and, and, and uh, around that. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the best way in which I could deal with that was to ensure that we had a methodology for achieving culture change, but to be very open, to be very accessible, to be very interactive uh, in the way that I engage with staff. There were around about um, 1,600 members of staff many of whom had never n never worked in the uh, private sector at all. Um, uh, so th there was a big job of, of, of culture change. Culture change was one of the work streams. Within that, there were a range of other work streams about you know, 
primarily driven around a new operating model. And um, so that, that, would, that was one of the key ones. But there was a technology change, there was people change, uh, there was a stakeholder uh, change in uh, work stream as well. Various different work streams, I built it around work streams. Each of those work streams had to identify clear benefits, work to achieve those benefits, had to uh, identify the milestones that they were achieving, and we built a plan around that. And, and my job was to, to once I built the governance to, to um, uh, oversee that, was to ensure that we kept a task and, um, and managed by exception. So, you know, uh, there, were, there were clear expectations about what people were required to achieve in leading their work streams. Um, but as long as they were on track, largely, you know, that, that things managed, w managed fine. It's when things went off track, when exceptions emerged, that we then were able to drill down and deal with the problems that arose. And, and by and large, they tended to arise around culture and culture change and technology. Technology is always, in my experience, technology is always a struggle. Um, but um, uh, you know, but the, the, those two areas aside, uh, by and large, there wasn't a lot of exception reporting. There wasn't a lot of management. The, the thing that I think is, 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 is crucial within it all, is, though, is to... Um, this is tough. This is really tough to, to manage a, an organisation that big um, uh, to, and in a very, very exposed uh, media climate. There was a lot of media attention uh, and to, to drive forward a, a change plan. Um, and one of the things I think that gets forgotten about is you know, actually, if you do that, if you get to the end point that you're expecting, um, to celebrate the fact, you know, this is this is pretty big change. So one of the things that I made a real issue of was ensuring that that we really celebrated our achievements. We'd done a hell of a lot of work, a hell of a lot of change. People had got moved many many miles in in changing the way in which they worked, and then to to acknowledge that was seemed to me to be a crucial part of it. So that's broadly speaking how I went about it. Thank you for that. I do have a supplementary question, however. So there's eight, eight questions with, with two questions in each one. You can find 16 questions yeah. thereabouts. Anyway, in a changing political climate, how do you ensure that you actually stay up to date with the policy and guidance from our central government? Um, keep in touch with them, I think, is the, the way in which I tend to work. I mean, to be honest, my, my, my background's mainly Home Office and MIJ. And, and what I've always tried to do is to, to keep in touch with, well, with ministers. I usually find that working with the minister's office is the best way, keeping in touch with the minister's office and keeping in touch with the policy leads and having a regular dialogue with those people ensures that you not only know what's, you know, what's there now, but what's on the horizon. Because you know, the, these things have a long gestation period. And um, as, as, as long as you, you know, the best, the best position to, do, to be in is not only to know what's publicly been announced, but what's brewing, what's on the way and keeping ahead of the game. So that's, that's the way I've tended to work. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Carr. I mean, obviously you'll have opportunities with uh, you liaison with other chief executives of other PCC areas, won't you? So I'm sure you'll have many conversations. Um, moving on, uh, Councillor Ruth Camomile. Over to you, Ruth. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, Paul. Morning. I may call you Paul. Yes, of course. Um, what I'd like to know is, can you um, provide a, a a specific example that demonstrates your ability to manage change or to inspire colleagues to do things differently. Um, I'd like to know what was your role in that process and how successful was it in the outcome? Okay, <clears throat> I think I've given two, two examples. I'll, do, I'll choose another one. Okay, so the uh, the examples I've given were um, uh, the the one at Working Links and the Offender Management one, both of which were I would I would call them transformation programs. You know that they they involved a level of change that was transformative. It it, it left the organisation in a very different place. Um, but just to choose a different example, the the previous organisation I I worked with was um, uh, Interserve. Again, a, a large private sector organisation, and um, that uh, that process was the start of the privatisation of probation services. And uh, my responsibility was to design the new way of working, uh, to articulate that, uh, and and then to pursue a change programme to to put that into place. Um, the 
So the model I've always adopted is to make the vision as clear as possible. Um, I, I don't believe in having vague amorphous visions. So the vision in all of the examples I've given so far, the vision is clear, it's written down, it's available to people. They can ask questions about it. I consult on it. It's collaboratively developed. In the InterServe one, it was um, collaboratively developed uh, with users as well. So uh, whilst developing it, I'll, there was quite a period of time before it was implemented, I had a group of users involved in the design and development of the model. So I actually had offenders working with us to help design the way in which we'd work and to give it, um, to give the model some uh, credence, some applicability uh, to their environment. They're the people that are going to experience it. They're the people that are going to have to live it and breathe it. As well as that, a group of practitioners. So people that were really at the, the coal face of, of doing this work were involved in the design and development of it from the start. And then when we, um, you know, when it was finished, when it was ready, uh, uh, the, the key thing was that I knew that this had... Um, the, the backing of people that knew what it was all about behind it. In terms of putting it into place, um, I, I actually left InterServe before we finalised it, but I put the change programme into place. I um, oversaw the, the development and implementation of it. The programme, I mean, similar programme management structure to the one I've just described. Uh, very much about articulating the, the vision, identifying the benefits and and pursuing those benefits rigorously through a program management methodology, through work streams, through plans, through risk management, through issues management. The one area I think it's important, though, that I haven't touched on so far, that was is a key part to achieving transformative change, is to be clear about what the benefits are that you're pursuing. Um, and, and in my experience, that's, that's often not done very well. Um, now, those benefits range from imp you know, effectiveness benefits, getting, doing things better, achieving more, being clear about the outcomes that you're pursuing and demonstrating that you have achieved them more. And that was a tricky thing to do in the world of working with offenders because those outcomes are by no means universally understood or agreed. Um, but that was a key part of it, understanding what the outcomes were, in particular about reducing reoffending. Um, and that was something I did and something that I would want to pursue and carry on with. That clarity of outcome is, is, is crucial to me. There are other benefits as well. Some of those are efficiency benefits and the use of new technology and demonstrating that you know if you invest in new processes, new IT, there's always an IT dimension to it, that actually that doesn't end up costing you an arm and a leg, that it actually saves money. And, and I think being rigorous about how you track benefits is a good way of doing that. And efficiency also is, in this area at least, uh, about reducing resource. And, and that was quite a challenge um, because reducing resource very often means fewer people delivering services. And that's been a, a key theme of running public services for, for many years now <coughs> and isn't an easy thing to do. Um, so... Uh, what I was keen to do was to ensure that we did that in a, an entirely ethical way, an appropriate way, so no nothing, no compulsory reductions in staffing. All was done on a voluntary basis at the rate that was recommended by the government, but pursuing a, a, a resource reduction plan that involved reducing staff, but delivering the same quality of service. That's quite tough going, but that's what we achieved. So that that that's the you know that's a, another example recently that I've pursued. Does that answer your question? Yes, that answers. Thank you, Councillor Boyce. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, I, I shall be brief. What experience do you have of delivering improved services at a time of diminishing resources? How would you set about this, and how good are you at multitasking? <laughs> But I'll leave the multitasking. I, I, you know, the multitasking. I'm a man, so you know is that. <laughs> um, the, um, uh, I mean, uh, reducing resources is, you know, that's the world we're in, isn't it? Really, and and so, I've operate operating delivering operations has been my background, 
um, delivering ch delivering operations while delivering change has been my background for the past 10 years. Um, and um, so it's a very, very familiar uh, scenario. I've had to do that in, in all the settings that I've worked in. Um, the, uh, I think the key thing is, um, partly as I've already described, being, being clear what, what it is you're trying to achieve. Uh, the organisations that I've worked in have always been, they've, been, they've developed historically. They have done things because of the historical expectations upon them to do those things. And I think one of the benefits of, uh, of a period of austerity is, um, I mean, it's not always popular, but, you know, that, that's where we're at. One of the benefits is that you have to go back to basic principles and think, well, why am I doing things? What am I doing it for? What's the purpose that sits behind this? And being clear about, you know, what it is you're trying to achieve. Uh, for me, I mean, I've described the example in, in InterServe where I did that very, very much in collaboration with users of service and practitioners. So it wasn't uh, one of the dangers you have in this sort of environment is that you, you design something in a darkened room, uh, you, you take it to a board, uh, it signs it off, and then you drop it on people from a great height. And they have no commitment, no involvement in it. They just have to endure it. And I, I think that's the very worst way of doing it. I think one of the key ways of actually managing austerity, uh, managing delivery of services in, in a straightened circumstances is to involve people and to, to use the skills and knowledge and background of people to help you do what they, uh, what, what's needed. Um, you, you know, people who are delivering services are very, very familiar with uh, ways in which you could do things better, achieve things more, get a greater quality at a lower cost. So I've unashamedly drawn on that experience in, in all of the changes that I've done use the experience of people from you know, the various backgrounds that uh, the various different practices that uh, I've been responsible for and use their, their knowledge and expertise to design things in a more efficient way and to help me and, and the people working for me to understand what's absolutely crucial and, and what, what things we, can, we don't have to prioritise. When, when you talk to people, everything's a priority. Everything's absolutely essential, and and you know you can easily get lost in that. I think you've got to be tough in that sort of environment. You've got to make tough choices, um, but if you do it in a collaborative way, if you draw on the skills and knowledge and experience of people, if you encourage them to help you identify solutions, then you can go a long way. So that that's been the general approach that I've adopted. It's familiar territory. I'm not trying to pretend it's easy. It's not easy. You know, they, 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 these are these are uh, difficult choices. But you know, someone's got to do it, and someone's got to manage it in a, a, a you know in a very determined way. Thank you. You mentioned the word austerity, and it, people have this fear of this word. But I did actually look it up in the dictionary what it meant, and it simply means living within one's means. Oh, right. I've, <laughs> so I've lived by austerity the whole of my sixty-six <laughs> years, and. Uh, but people really get fearful of living within one means. I don't quite get it myself. Um, but hey-ho, that's where we are. Moving on. Um, Mrs Carter. Thank you, Chair. I'm Helen. Hello, Paul. Hiya. Um, I'm sure our paths must have crossed at some point looking at your CV. Um, in terms of um, the question I have, it's um, the OPC is required to build good relationships with partners um, in the area of community safety but tough decisions will need to be made on which of these partners receive funding from the uh, OPCC. How would you ensure that commissioning decisions were impartial and fair and that there is effective engagement with stakeholders and partners? OK. I, I, if I start with the impartial and fair bit, then, um, I mean, it, but probably covering similar, similar territory, but um, commissioning decisions being impartial and fair, I think, is... It's important to to build decisions on. You know, I use the what I call a theory of change. You know, how why, how do what people are proposing? How do how are they? How do they believe they work? What benefits they're trying to achieve, and how can they demonstrate that those benefits are are, are real? And <clears throat> obviously, before you've done anything, 
it's it's hard to demonstrate that and the danger is i found in in the past is that you you only do the tried and tested things and you don't innovate i think if you know it's important to get balance to do tried and tested things but also to be able to innovate and you do deliver new services as well because otherwise how, how on earth are you going to do anything new um but um you know you can't just come up with you know wonderful ideas and and just let them loose that's you know that's difficult to do i think the important thing to do when you're 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 innovating and developing new services and trying new things out is to demonstrate the the rationale that sits behind them and often that's using evidence evidence of of you know from from research from from regulatory reports from benchmarking reports to to use to draw on those that experience to demonstrate that what we're doing has got a sort of evidence base that sits behind it and has got some validity and also to be able to demonstrate that there is a, a clear rationale a clear conceptual logic that sits behind the, the proposed service that that has a um, integrity about it that makes sense that is clearly of, of value so i would i would look to do um, develop services that have a range of things from the tried and tested the things we know work that are things that are delivered well right through to the innovative things that but not not innovation for the sake of it innovation that has some evidence base sitting behind it that that convinces the panel that there is some value in it i think uh, d- s- sitting behind that obviously there have to be criteria that demonstrate what what services are chosen and what aren't. And the stronger the evidence base, the stronger the track record of delivery, the better it is. There's always a value for money dimension sitting behind that as well. And I I think it's important that services demonstrate that they are delivering services in a value for money way. And again, using, you know, drawing on benchmarks, that sort of thing can help you make those decisions. I think also sitting behind it is is the ability to demonstrate that um, you, you have a clear idea of what it is you're trying to achieve. Again, the, the, the term outcomes or value, whatever we want to call it, um, is, I think, a key thing in delivering public services. Very often what people describe, in my experience, is a set of inputs, what we're going to do, not what we're going to achieve. I think it's absolutely crucial to, to articulate what you're going to achieve as the key starting point and demonstrate how, how you're going to achieve that. Um, I think also beyond that is um, that organisations then have to be able to demonstrate once they've you know, once those services have been procured and they have the green light to press ahead that there is a, a performance management regime that sits behind them uh, that that ensures that they're delivering things to the standard that they say they are. Um, now you know that that in my view can sometimes be. I mean I've come from a, a background where the contracts were. Uh, you know, weighed in in you know kilograms. <laughs> I mean, they were so huge, and and that can be a, a really tough process. I think you know the danger is that you you get into sort of the minutiae when you're managing organisations and you expect too much. And actually, a lot of the resource goes on providing the information. I think it's important to be absolutely clear of the sort of headline things that you want organisations to achieve them. And, and monitoring uh, their achievement of those, not getting down too granular into all the fine detail of how they're doing it. Um, so I'd be very much more in favour of managing by output and, and by outcome. And I've completely forgotten the other two parts of the question. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Um, I think one of the things I'm really interested in here is around the um, working with stakeholders and partners, particularly maybe where you've had a relationship or there's been a relationship before, for their, um, the, the delivery of services, but the decisions have been made perhaps where things are changing. You've talked about innovation, you've talked about looking at um, how you manage it and track performance. So I suppose it's really that managing, it's a, it's a stakeholder management thing here about how you would manage that in terms of the sensitivities of where maybe the relationships are changing with some of those people that we've been working with and how you would manage that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I suppose fundamentally within that is building good relationships. Um, and uh, ensuring that those relationships flourish even when even when you know financial decisions might not go the right way um, I unashamedly value uh, my background in relation to that my background is one of working in people people based services and uh, so I've, I'm trained as a probation officer that's my practice background I'm also trained as a social worker and I think what that brings me is a, a relationship um, building skill that I value, I think has been has served me well in my 
working life. And it's, uh, you know, the key elements of it, as I see it, are um, building you know, positive connections with people, um, uh, working collaboratively with people, building from strengths, building in, you know, work relationships that are exploratory, that are about identifying synergy, looking for mutual endeavour, those sorts of things are, are, are the, the, the approach I adopt. So I'd want to um, use that methodology in building those relationship and, uh, relationships and sustaining them, um, even when decisions are uh, you know, not necessarily the, the ones that they, they would want to pursue. In terms of managing stakeholders, I mean, I, I have um, quite a forensic um, uh, uh, methodology, I suppose. Um, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, it, 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 what, what I think I see in Leicestershire is a really rich set of partnerships uh, and, uh, and, and, a, and a willingness to engage, and, and that's clearly vital. In, in a working environment, and isn't the case in in all sectors? I think I don't think you don't realise what you've not got until you've not got it. And I think I think Leicestershire does have it, uh, which, which is great, great news. Uh, what I tend to do is to to build in a, uh, a you know a sort of model that is based on identifying you know who the key audiences are, what their sphere of influence is, you know, and then identifying you know who who to to most closely work with identify how those uh, channels of working with them, what, what best ways are of working with them, uh, which might be, I, you know, I, I, believe, I don't believe in setting up different channels. You know, very often uh, you, you interact with people and build relationships through meetings. There are an awful lot of meetings, strategic level meetings that, that go on with this environment, and there are opportunities to build those relationships and nurture those relationships over time. So I, 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 would, u- I would use those. I think... Uh, also, what's um, important, though, to do is to um, you know ensure that uh, those relationships are uh, sustained over time, and that uh, that you carry on building and and ensuring that you're you know you're doing things that are relevant to to each other, not 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 of you know value in an imbalanced way to one party or another. Thank you, Paul. Um- Sorry, this is a supplementary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, what role would the police and crime plan play in this process? So that's in terms of, of working with them, in terms of the funding, working in the future with them around commissioning arrangements, etc. <coughs> yeah, um, perhaps I should have said that from the start. <laughs> I mean, clearly the police and crime plan is what we are um, here to deliver. And, and so commissioning decisions would have to sit around that police and crime plan. The police and crime plan is the, the priority. That's what we all want to achieve. That's what we signed up to do. So, so my aim would be to ensure that what we're doing is, is focused on maximising the possibility of achieving those outputs. I think it's a very clear plan. It's, it's, it's clearly been uh, seen and, and approved by this body. It gives us a clear mandate for what we are pursuing. So my aim would be to to use uh, the police and crime plan as our vision. It's the, it's where we want to get to. Uh, having said that, obviously things develop, as I said earlier. You know, and, and that doesn't mean to say you can just sit back and let the police and crime plan be run itself. You still got to keep an eye on what's happening, and there are lots of things happening. You know, I suspect we've got a bumpy ride politically because. Brexit's going to throw in a few curveballs and things like that. So, you know, you've still got to keep scanning the political horizon, ensuring you know what's going on. But the yardstick of success, as I see it, is the ability to achieve that police and crime plan. Thank you, Helen. Um, Councillor Sood. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Hello, Paul. Hello. I'll come straight to the question. I mean, in the context of the public sector equality <laughs> duty, how will you ensure that the work of the PCC's office reflects the needs of and connects with the diverse Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland communities? Okay. Um, the, um, I, I spoke already about uh, the importance of community engagement. And, and for me, delivery of public services is, you know, delivering what the public wants and, and ensuring that they, you know, we give, we understand what the public wants and that we deliver it. And that's easy to say, harder to do, because um, sometimes we have communities that are harder to reach uh, so that we can, we can engage with communities through forums, through you know, using social media uh, and, and, and other, other methodologies. But um, 
sometimes those communities are much more inaccessible. I mean, my background is working with offender services, and uh, and and many of those communities just aren't open to the normal, easy methods of of engaging. So you've got to go out to communities and engage with with the communities, find the the forums, find the opportunities to 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 work with people, and try and understand uh, what it is that they want. And that you know, the example I gave earlier was of of co-development so you know it's as in my view it's not just about um uh, talking to people and listening to people and uh, you know trying to understand what it is that they want i think a sort of higher level is co-development where you actually get the users of service to work with you to try and design what those services are and i've got a number of you know a number of examples of having done that uh, where we've you know, drawn on the users of the service to actually help design what it is we want to do. I think beyond that also is um, you know, the, sort of the option of co-delivery. We've got very rich communities, very rich, diverse uh, uh, you know, experience around in, in Leicestershire. And I think one of the ways of ensuring that those services are delivered in ways that are of value to those communities is to draw, the, draw on those communities to deliver them. Um, the again, and my background is mainly in um, uh, mainly an offender working with offenders, but the ways in which I've done that are, for instance, using services like community payback, uh, uh, providing community payback to local communities so that they can run services for themselves. And I did that in a in a very very big way in in working links, uh, where I actually sixty um, percent of those services were run by the communities so the communities took responsibility for identifying the projects that they wanted to achieve and we provided the labor for them to go out and and deliver what what they wanted which ranged actually from um uh it ranged from you know clearing a, a waste an area of waste ground to running uh, providing services in, a, in an um, um old people's home that sort of thing so there's, there's a quite a wide range of services and actually that the, the people that are providing those services benefit as well because they feel that sort of richness of value and and the importance of what they're offering and it has a positive impact on them so um I suppose coming back to the question, the, the key things for me are engaging with the communities, ensuring that you access the hard-to-reach communities, ensuring that you do it using multiple channels of engagement, um, but not just seeing, you know, consulting and communicating as the, the be-all and end-all, looking to extend that into to, to co-design opportunities and co-delivery opportunities as well. Thank you, Chair. Paul, during your previous replies you have mentioned about criminal justice probation your experience with that but you know the police and crime commission the communities in Leicestershire we well really value our neighborhood policing yeah but now there is a reduction in the police officers for the public sector duties recognizing and valuing the diversity and equality and challenging intolerance whether it is discrimination, harassment, victimization, advancing equality of opportunities and fostering good relations. I mean, Chair, like the word you said, austerity, and how will you manage within your managed means? Can you give us some good examples how you have dealt with the community, these sort of issues in the communities? Yeah, I mean, the, um, I, th I think referring to neighborhood policing, I, I mean, the suggestion, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the suggestion there is that that's sort of declining. I don't think that's the way, certainly, that I would want to go. And, and, and uh, perhaps that's an indication. I mean, it seems to me neighbourhood policing is a bit of a touchstone issue. That is a direct engagement with the communities that we, we want to work for. And if there's any retrenchment in, in neighbourhood policing, I think that's the role of the Police and Crime Commissioner to say, well, hang on a minute, that's not part of the, the remit as we see it. The operating model clearly needs to have local engagement. It needs to be locally visible. So whatever developments, whatever uh, redesigns of services that we have to do to achieve reductions in, in cost, neighbourhood policing clearly has to be a key part of that. 
And and so, you know, I don't think uh, as Police and Crime Commission and certainly the Police and Crime Plan would envisage a, a reduction in those services. Having said that, um, you know, we, as, as Joe said, we, we need to live within our means. We can't magic money from thin air. And so one of the things I think it's important to do is look creatively about how you can do it in, in ways that actually allow you to live within your means. And, and I, I'm new to this, so, you know, I'm, this is early days for me. But um, the, things like the use of uh, volunteer services, specials, uh, drawing on PCSOs, not having to do it in the traditional ways, but to looking to, to other ways in which we can to, to, to deliver those services is, is um, uh, important to me. I think in, in criminal justice terms, another example that I uh, pursued when I was in my last role was to um, to move away from services that were delivered in a what I call a, a, a sort of back office environment, a, 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 an ec- outside the community environment, uh, to deliver those services in community settings. So what I did in uh, in my last role was to shut an awful lot of offices. Uh, and to move services, so to take people out of offices and to move them into, um, they were obvious, often community associations, uh, into uh, church halls sometimes, a lot of different, uh, supermarkets sometimes. Uh, and so the services were delivered from a multitude of different environments. But I think the, the, benefit, the benefit of that was it was a much more natural setting for people to engage in. There were much more accessible services, there were locally available services, services and to put it bluntly um, some of the uh, some of the office based environments that we previously operated in were pretty unpleasant you know th- these were much more natural environments fresher brighter more open accessible environments so that, that, that's another example of the way in which I think that we could without spending lots of money with recognizing the the austerity um, requirements on us nevertheless be more accessible and be more open and provide services that are of value to people locally. Thank you. Um, now, as far as I'm aware, Paul, some more good news. The final question, as far as I'm aware. Colonel Martin. <laughs> Um, so yeah, yeah, yes, I am familiar with them, um, and um, I, I have there are a couple of things that I think apply uh, that probably are unusual to me. One of which is that I've said this already, but I think it's worth repeating. Is it, to me the sort of fundamental principle is that if you're in public service, you're doing things that are of value to the public, and that that that. Um, that notion of value is, you know, the, the sort of bottom line for me. If it's not of value, then why the hell are we doing it, frankly? Um, so um, that that is the sort of core element for me, uh, that, that what I want to ensure is that, and, and I think it's something to test yourself on at all times, is what I'm doing really of value? Is there public value in, in, in doing this work? Whatever it may be. I'm, I'm from a, an operational background, and so I, that's the yardstick I apply to operations that we deliver. If it's not of value, then, then, then don't do it and maximise that value at all times. I think um, beyond that, the, there are a number of beliefs I have, I think, that give me um, a real grounding in this, that I think you know, ensure that I do keep I don't go off and do things that are inappropriate for the public sector. One of which is, I won't go through them all, I'll bore you to death, <laughs> but one of which is, I think everyone's special. You know, when, when you're working, these are people-facing roles. These are, these are working with diverse communities, people from different backgrounds. And I think having the notion that everyone's special, everyone's unique, that we have to provide a, a valuable service to everybody in a personalised way is important. 
And uh, an another uh, belief that I, th you know, underpins the way I approach things is everything's important. Um, obviously, you've got to prioritize. You've got to do things that are, you know, the, the most important things. Um, but to do things with a degree of importance and purpose and priorities is essential to me. So those are probably my, that's m more my background. I mean, more, more coming, but more centrally to the, uh, the Nolan principles. One that's absolutely crucial to me is that of integrity. You know, uh, and, and I define that, doing the right thing. You know, and, and doing the right thing might be different for different people. That's always a, a, a testing issue. But you know, as long as I'm doing the right thing, for, as I see it, as I understand it, as long as I'm testing myself and I'm applying the principle of value, then that, that's a key part of it for me. Um, another element for me is to be inclusive. Uh, and collaborative, that working with people, in, involving people, ensuring that people understand what I'm trying to do and being accessible is, is a key part of it for, for me. Fairness is an, uh, another part, ensuring that you know, the services that are delivered are fairly delivered, they're appropriate, that they are accessible to all, that, that they're not focused on one community or another community, that all communities have equal access as far as is possible. And another... Uh, Another element for me that um, sl probably sits slightly outside the normal no Nolan principles is that of learning. I think um, as, as organisations delivering public services, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to get things wrong occasionally. And as long as we have uh, an expectation that we and all the people that work for us have the ability to learn and develop and change in response to things that go wrong, then we'll do well. And I, I mean learning not just from the immediate things that we do that, that don't work in the way anticipated, but learning for, by scanning the horizon, by, by you know being aware of the research that's out there, being aware of benchmarks, being aware of regulatory reports and doing whatever we can to ensure that we apply the learning that comes from them. So I've probably covered more than, <laughs> more than I meant to, but hopefully that gives you a flavour. Well, thank you for that. Um, a rising out of that really is the fact that I picked up from your CV that you're a director of uh, Encompass Innovation Limited. Yeah. Um, now, what, to what extent do you think that will impinge on your role as chief executive of the APCC? And do you perceive that there might be any conflicts of interest in your directorship um, and your new role? Um. Not, not at all, because um, the uh, the no, the company is now dormant. Um, so the company, I, I, the the company, I can't stop it yet, because there are tax returns required at the end of the tax year. As soon as those tax returns are done, all the VAT returns are done, that company will be no more. So um, that that's that's the bottom line there. That company has no existing contract up until last Thursday. I was working uh, f for the MOJ. That was, well, I had two contracts outstanding. Um, uh, that, that contract has now ceased. Uh, the other contract has ceased as well. Um, and there are, I'm not going out pursuing any more work. The only reason I haven't folded the company at the moment is because I need to do tax returns and finalise the... And I've got to pay an accountant till March. <laughs> pay an accountant. I mean, her job will be to, to um, you know, finish the books and, and wind the company up. So it'll be, it'll be wound up in March. Thank you very much. OK. All right, thank you, Paul. Um, I'm pretty sure there are no questions. No one else is trying to attract my attention at all. No, so thank you very much. To me, you've answered all the questions. Back to now. The final question. Sorry, Chair, about that, because I did want to pick one or two points that you raised. Uh, morning, Paul, anyway. Morning. Um, being a local councillor, and I work very close with the police on uh, ground level, how would you uh, connect with us, whether the city councillors or county councillors or Rutland councillors, how would you work closely with that? Or would it be your policy against the police panel or police day-to-day uh, -day activity that now this is the po process that you need to follow or this is the way we need to work on that basis? How would you engage in that context? Okay. Uh, the how, how would I engage with you? Was uh, you know is, is building a relationship. Um, so what I I would envisage 
I mean, obviously, I'm familiarising myself with things at the moment uh, um, and, and not actively pursuing any of the work, but my aim would be to build relationships with, with all of you, particularly the people in this room, because you're members of the Police and Crime Panel and your views are therefore absolutely crucial to me. So building a relationship with you would be part of... And, and understanding the communities that you represent and ensuring that what we're doing is relevant to your communities would be a key part of my role, as I see it. Uh, involves going out and visiting your communities and I mean one of the things I'm, I'm quite keen on doing is um, and, and I've always done is uh, going out with say a, a, a local neighbourhood policing officer and spending time with that neighbourhood policing uh, officer meeting the local communities understanding the local issues I mean obviously I can't do that all the time but I think what what I'd really wanted and I love doing it to be honest I love doing that sort of thing is uh, go, go out and understand the communities and see how things operate at the cold face because very often you know if you're sitting in you're sitting in a, a darkened room somewhere you don't really get a proper understanding of what things are like locally one of the one of the reasons I didn't say this so I probably ought to have said this earlier um, one of the things that uh, really attracted me to um, uh, to this job, I should have said this, is um, uh, what I believe in is is localism, and um, and and actually one of the frustrations I had in my previous role was that um, uh, that that localism was disappearing. Um, the uh, I mean broadly speaking, I ought to be slightly careful what I say here, but uh, I, you know the Ministry of Justice services tend to be delivered nationally. They're centrally driven. They're centrally directed. And um, and centrally contracted, and and that is not how I see public services. If if I'm honest, I'm, I'm you know it's not as clear cut as that. But I think the beauty of what's here is that these are locally delivered services, and and that appeals to me. You know, I I've been in Leicestershire for years. I love the place, uh, and I want to do things that are good for Leicestershire. Uh, and and I can't do that if I'm I'm running an organisation that really doesn't you know has a single model that operates nationally, and that's that's the way I've seen things go in the prison probation world. There's not uh, the local engagement. There's not the local understanding. There is uh, how many how many probation people have come to you and spoken to you about you know what's going on in your council area? I, I'd hazard a guess none. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think it's important to do that. I think it's important to, to operate on a local basis and get in tune with the local environment. That's crucial to me. OK, and a very final question, John. Uh, thank you, Chair. <coughs> I've just noticed we've probably not asked a, a, a relatively simple question, which um, probably isn't easy to answer. Um, you obviously work for the PCC who currently is Willie back and over a period of time may change. The question is, how do you see your relationship with the PCC uh, now and in the future? I, I think I need to have a positive working relationship with the PCC. I need to, you know, work with the PCC to ensure that we deliver the police and crime plan. But I do have a, a, a role which is uh, the monitoring role. And ensuring that uh, you know what the PCC does is appropriate, legal, uh, fair, and um, so then whilst uh, you know it's close and collaborative working relationship, I think also at the same time what I need to do is to ensure that I'm able to stand back and be objective, and to be able to advise and to be able to. Um, insist upon things that you know when things aren't right if things are done that aren't appropriate I do have experience of this so I've worked um, I've worked with ministers uh, in Home Office and Ministry of Justice and um, uh, my experience has been that ministers can sometimes come up with some you know, what they think are whizzy ideas you know uh, things that their own schemes they want to do things um, Sometimes to um, you know, almost court popularity, shall I say? Yeah, but they're, they're not always credible schemes, and I've always found it, uh, you know, important to be able to say to the minister, well, without 
undermining the relationship. Clearly that relationship is important. You're a public servant, you're working as a minister, but to make it clear that you know, doing, doing something like that uh, wouldn't be legally okay. Uh, that would, you know, that would require new legislation, or it would break this uh, requirement of a contract, or whatever it is. So I, I think I think the the answer would be that a close, positive working relationship, but with the ability to be objective and to stand back and to say when things aren't right, and to be able to hold to that line no matter what. So that that's how I see it. All right. Well, thank you very much to all the questioners, and also thank you to you, Paul, for answering mm -hmm. them. Um, certainly to me, you, you did answer the questions, actually. I don't think you've prevaricated in any way at all. It, it's the most full explanation to each one, so thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the panel will now go into a closed session to make a decision. And um, I, as I said earlier, I'll be writing to the PCC tomorrow, and also you will be sent a copy of uh, the recommendations of this panel. So I invite you to leave us, and just, like I said, with a big thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I've